and welcome to the stay at home retreat experience this very unique experience but we're offering uh we're offering this during the coronavirus shutdown and this is for rcia for catholicism 101 for small group leaders for bible study attendees for the alpha groupies known as alcoholics you know for anybody else that would like to be here with us today welcome we welcome you retreat means to turn around it means to fall back right it means to go back to where you came from. For us, it means a time to slow down, don't watch the clock, stop watching the minute-by-minute minute news, right? Lose yourself in a time with God. Take things slowly. Don't rush it. Invite God in. During this time of worldwide shutdown, there's a, a definite test of character and obedience and, and of faith. It's the kind of faith that's going to shape us, right? We get stronger muscles by exercising our muscles and pushing them hard. We get stronger faith by exercising faith and pushing it hard as well. Right? So enter in with us with prayer um, as we begin this experience in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty Jesus, we love you. We praise you. We honor you. We give you all glory, Almighty Lord. We thank you for electricity. We thank you for our devices. We thank you for the Internet. Um, Lord, we ask for you to protect those who are sick, protect those who need you right now during this time, and especially be with those who are giving care to the sick. Be with all of our government leaders. Be with everyone making decisions, Lord. Um, we ask, Lord, that you mold us and you shape us like, like hot wax. You shape us into the, the mold and into the shape that you would like us to be, Lord. So help us to open our ears to hear your voice, open our hearts, and, and, and expand our hearts so that we can receive more and more of what you would like to give us. Right? Let us be like children, hearing, believing, and obeying. Right? Um, like, let us be like so many saints who hear your words and then live it out. Almighty oh, Jesus, we ask all this in your holy, precious name. Amen. Here's a prayer, a great prayer from St. Augustine. Flood the path with light, attributed to St. Augustine. God of our life, there are days when the burdens we carry chafe our shoulders and weigh us down. When the road seems dreary and endless, the skies gray and threatening, when our lives have no music in them, and our hearts are lonely, and our souls have lost their courage, flood the path with light. Turn our eyes to where the skies are full of promise. Tune our hearts to brave music. Give us the sense of comradeship with heroes and saints of every ages. And so quicken our spirits, that we may be able to encourage the souls of all who journey with us on the road of life. To your honor and glory. Amen. Well, before we dig in, let's have a couple laughs together, because that's part of being a re on a retreat as well, right? Some of you may not know that Father Chaz is well known for rubbing elbows with some really famous people, some superstars of the faith. Did you know that he once roomed with Father Michael Gately? You know, Father Gately, who's up to 33 days to morning glory, right? He was given a sound word of advice once from Father Benedict Rochelle from EWTN, right? very, very famous priest. He taught called and gifted with the author Sherry Waddell overseas. Sherry also wrote Forming Intentional Disciples. He knows her, and, uh, and they've worked together. He met St. Pope John Paul II, right? He's a chaplain for all the sports heroes and their coaches at U of M, right? Rumor has it Brant Petrie asked for study tips from Father Chaz for a final exam one time. It's even been said that Pope Francis got the outline for his last encyclical from an email that Father Chaz sent to Pope Benedict XVI. That's what the rumor is. And there's a picture that recently surfaced. Father Chaz was having his shoes shined by none other than Dr. Scott Hahn. Crazy, right? You probably didn't know what a superstar our pastor was. Huh? And also, before we get rolling today, here's a word from our sponsor who made this day, this retreat day, entirely. Introducing the latest CD from Holy Parodies and the Don't Worship This Way Band. It's Wrong Worship. Sing of your love. Sundays only sing of your love on Sundays. I will sing of your love on Sundays. Then this feeling is gone by Monday. I will give 
now and get these bonus tracks. Is this song? Sing with me how great is this song? Man, I love to sing. Oh, yes, just to sing this song. Savior, I don't need a savior. I'm busy living my life. Busy living my life. Christmas. Church on Christmas and maybe Easter too. So my faith is renewed. I've sung this song for years. It's now a standard here. Just go, go through the motion. Hallelujah. Lift up your hands. Call now to get these just plain wrong worship songs. Sing them in your church, your car, anywhere you want to act like you're worshiping when you really aren't. Don't delay, or yours today. Okay, now on to something serious. We're going to do Lexio Divina. In the ancient method of the church, we're going to do a divine reading, a Divina Lectio, a Lectio Divina, divine reading, where we take the scripture and we're going to pray with it. And um, here, here, this is a format that we've been using with our friends from Evangelical Catholic. Read, relate, respond, and rest. Read, relate, respond, and rest. Read it, probably even a couple of times. Read it slowly. Relate it. Relate what we just read to our lives. And then we talk with Jesus about it. And we respond. You know, Ask him what our response should be. Ask him to, to give us the gifts to do the very things that he wants us to respond with. Right? Ask Jesus to plunge us into the power that we need to really do something to change our lives. And then we rest. We rest in silence for a few minutes with him. So here's the story that we're going to do. We're going to do Lectio with Jesus calming the storm. That just seems to fit really well uh, with what's going on right now. Mark chapter 4, verse 36 to 41. We're going to have this read, first of all, by an actor named David Suchet. He's one of the best known and best loved actors in Britain. Um, he read this just before Holy Week in St. Paul's Cathedral back in 2017, and it was recorded. He's an Anglican in the Church of England, and he was converted to Christ as an adult when he was reading the letter of St. Uh, Paul to the Romans, which is what we're studying on Tuesdays. He's, he was reading the letter of St. Paul while, while in a hotel, in a hotel Bible, and it totally changed his heart. God just came alive to David while he was reading this, right? So the Lord grabbed his heart and called David to him. Let him let the Lord grab your heart as well. We're going to listen to this reading of Mark chapter 4, and then we're going to read it um, on the screen, and then we'll do some Lectio Divina. That day, when evening came, he said to his disciples, let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. A furious squall came up, and waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up rebuked the wind and said to the waves, quiet, be still. 
Then the wind died down, and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, Who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. Now we'll spend some time reflecting. There are seasons of life where there is no storm, there's no demon possessions, there's no leprosy, no, leprosy, no illness, no crisis. We seem to operate on our own in those times. It's when a crisis arises that we reveal who we really rely on and what our character is like, right? Well, what are the wind and the waves in our lives right now? What failure or sickness or stress or depression or fear or bad relationships, or tough job situations, or financial stress? What, what kinds of crisis are we facing in our lives, and what is God trying to reveal to us through that? What spiritual muscle is being tested and strengthened in the storm that we're in right now? And are you exercising that spiritual muscle, or are you ignoring it? Are you sitting on the couch, watching on the sidelines, or are you engaged? Because in this scene, God does not allow the disciples to just sit idly by and watch. He literally throws them into the middle of a storm, a life-threatening situation. And God does that for each and every one of us at times in our lives, right? God is unimaginable. He's beyond us. He's mysterious. The disciples even ask, who is this guy? That even nature responds to him. He is so mysterious, not only in his godliness and in his nature and in who he is, but also in his plan. The Bible is one continuous story, one movement, one action. And the communion of saints is the collection, the common union of all believers in Christ, past, present, future, including us, right? We're part of that same common union. We're part of that same continuous story and movement and one action, right? Sometimes it takes us a long time to trust, and often he takes us by surprise. Part of the mystery of, of this whole story that was really upsetting to me the first time I realized it is that Jesus knew the storm was coming. I mean, he's God. This was all a setup, right? He sent them straight into the storm. He sent them knowing that the storm was coming. So it is with the storms in our lives. He not only passively allows it, he sends us in. It's a setup. It's all a setup. Why? Because he wants us to exercise our spiritual muscles and to prepare us for eternity. Right? Well, let's talk about the will of Jesus for a minute. Theologians sometimes talk about the passive will of God or the permissive will, it's sometimes called. Things that he doesn't necessarily cause, but he allows. Like, Jesus does not cause sin or sadness or sickness or storms, right? But he allows it. And, uh, I mean, why would he allow bad things to happen to good people? Well, it happened to all of his people. It happened to Jesus, right? In Genesis chapter 50, there's this great story, the epic story of Joseph and his amazing technicolor dream coat. You may have seen the play or heard Donny Osmond you know, in the show. But at the end of this crazy story about Joseph, this adventure, it started from 11 brothers doing something terrible to their brother, little Joe. They were very jealous of Joe. And Joseph says at the end of the story, in chapter 50 of Genesis, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. Right? That, that's awesome. God's good will 
is to do something epic and good for Joseph and the people of Israel. And that good will was served through the bad will of Joseph's brothers. Okay? Now this does not mean that the brothers acted virtuously, like they did something really wicked. They sold their brother into slavery. They lied to dad that he was killed by savage goats, right? It does not mean that God smiles on those bad actions. And just because something good came of it, it doesn't mean he gives the brothers a free pass. And he doesn't say, ah, oh, no worries, it's okay. Because Holy Scripture and sacred tradition are pretty clear that we're responsible for sinful behavior. But God brings good out of even evil, right? St. Paul says famously in Romans that God works for good for those who love him. Chapter 8 of Romans. The Catechism of the Catholic Church says in paragraph 311, For Almighty God, because he is supremely good, would never allow any evil whatsoever to exist in his works if he were not so all-powerful and good as to cause good to emerge from evil itself. Okay, but this idea of God's permissive will is a mystery. When God is passive, he is, in a sense, he's like actively passive. And I know that sounds like a total contradiction. Sounds like nonsense. But it's that great both and thing of Christianity and of Catholic truth. He is actively choosing not to get in the way because he sees ahead and he sees that something good is going to come of this. St. Augustine said, for the things which God rightly wills, he accomplishes by the evil wills of bad men. Isn't that interesting? So it's this, this way of life for Christians. I like to call it the, the, that we see the world with uh, sacramental lenses or a sacramental worldview, right? We see with sacramental eyes. Always outside there are things going on, outside events and signs, things in the outside world. But inside, in the interior realm, in the spiritual realm, in the interior life, there is reality going on that we can't see. And part of that supernatural gift of faith is believing that God works good out of evil. That in the end it will make sense and we will see it. Right? In, a, in our time it's like, it's like we're looking at the wrong side of a quilt or a needlepoint or, or a painting. We're zoomed in so close that all we see are the rough edges of the cut cloth on the back end. We see the loose ends of the threads. We see the sloppy brush strokes. But in every suffering, remember, God is the quilter. God is the needlepoint artist. God is the painter. Amen? He sees the big picture with completeness, and he's pulling together a masterpiece. And it's just that from our perspective, we just we can't see it yet. Right? Notice in the story, sleeping Jesus is right there, right? He just seems a wee bit passive, maybe a little permissive, right? For us, he may be asleep in our lives. It feels like at least he is, but he's always with us. He's always in our boat. If we want peace in our soul, we have to awake Jesus. We have to wake up the inner Christ. We have to contact him through prayer, invite him into the middle of of the storm, right? We can just pray, tell it like it is, be honest. Jesus, I'm feeling like total dung, right? I choose my words carefully there. I'm really stressed out about this. Give me some direction. Give me some peace. What should I do, Lord? St. John of the Cross is an awesome saint from a long time ago who says it's kind of like there's a hidden wine cellar in her house. Jesus is right there. We just don't see him active and alive. It's like we have this hidden wine cellar. We just don't even know it's there. And when we find that hidden wine cellar, when we find that hidden Jesus, it's not merely strength and safety that it gives us, but there's even an element of joy and of celebration, maybe even a little intoxication, right? We want to party. We, we want to experience something more. That's what happens when Jesus wakes up in our boat, right? Invite him into your boat. Invite him into your storm. There's a great old Protestant devotional called My Utmost for His Highest. Um, it's written by a gentleman named Oswald Chambers. 
It was taken from his preaching uh, several century or several decades ago to World War I troops and, and the students that he had worked with. Um, Oswald Chambers had this amazing thought. I really love this. The same surf that causes stress in the swimmer produces super joy and excitement in the surfer. Right? The surfer uses the wind and the waves to accomplish something while the swimmer is beat up by those same waves. Jesus is like the surfer and we are like the swimmer. He's trying to teach us to surf the waves of our lives, to ride it out in style. When he leads us into the storm, he drives us into his arms. There are these great lyrics from a song by Unspoken, one of my favorite groups. Unspoken says, Let the thunder be my comfort, let the lightning be my guide, let the waves that rise around me hold me gently through the night, for the winds that seem against me push me right into your arms. Oh, teach me how to sleep in the storm. One more thought. Suffering and misery does not automatically make us holy. All right? I've suffered a lot of miserable people in life that I would not really count as among the holiest people I've ever met. Right? Catholics should not enjoy pain. We are not masochists. And we don't assume that everyone who suffers is very saintly. Right? But a healthy saint does not go out and shop for suffering in the store of crisis. You get me? We don't go looking for it. We don't go looking for suffering in, in the way of punishment. Like we're, we're not just looking for suffering for the sake of suffering. We're not looking for punishment for the sake of punishment. A healthy saint chooses God's will, and we accept what he brings into our lives. If we're brave, yes, we can ask God to share someone else's suffering with us. We can help carry the load. We can ask for that in a spiritual way. Lord, give me their suffering. We can suffer along with others. And we can suffer along with Jesus. Right? That's a whole other topic, though. But what I wanted to get at was the role of a Christian is to do the will of the Father. And we remember, no matter what, He's with us. Right? He is with us. We don't have to go looking for suffering. Ask Him what He wants us to do. Right? So, in the Lexio Divina, we read, um, we related it to our lives, we reflected on it, right? So, while you listen to this music video that's next, uh, what I want you to do is, I want you to think about what you're going to do. What is your response? We read, we relate, we respond. Then after the retreat, we're going to turn this off and sit in silence for a while, right? You're going to sit in silence. You're going to rest in his presence. You're going to rest. So here's a song from Unspoken uh, called Sleep in the Storm. chase your heart sometimes the path it may take me through the fire but if it's your desire lead me straight into the storm let the thunder be my comfort let the lightning be my guide let the waves that rise around me hold me gently through the night for the winds that seem against me push me right
Our friend Claire DeWitt is our fantastic youth minister and director of Youth Faith Formation at St. John. She'd like to share with you a few thoughts about the Mass, her experience with Jesus in the Eucharist. And then there's an amazing video just immediately after Claire speaks. You have to watch this. It's called The Veil Removed. We've talked about before how in the Mass we are like time travelers, like right? We are really experiencing Jesus um, in the moments of, of the crucifixion, in the moments of the resurrection, in the moments of the Last Supper. We are there with him, and he is with us here and now. And we're surrounded by angels and saints, right? This short video shows it. It's breathtaking. Again, it's called The Veil Removed. Hello everybody, my name is Claire. Um, and for those of, the, of you that don't know me, I am the coordinator of Youth Faith Formation at St. John's. I absolutely love uh, my job, I love my parish family, and I love this team that I get to be on and get to work on um, together with. And uh, I'm just so grateful for technology that um, even in moments when we're social distancing and in quarantine, we can still um, be together and still learn more about our faith and come together. So um, the thing that Todd had reached out to me and asked me if I would be willing to just offer some of my thoughts on um, is actually one of my favorite things to talk about, which is the mass. And so um, the mass has been something that has been fully kind of integrated in my life since before really I can remember. Um, I, a little bit of background on me, I come from a very Catholic family. I might be one of the more like stereotypical Catholic families. I um, was homeschooled K through 12. I am one of nine, I have eight siblings. Uh, my dad is an organist and for many years played at our church. Um, and uh, my older brother is a priest. So there's just a, a lot of, um, Jesus and a lot of uh, Catholicism in our household um, for most of my life. Um, and Mass was definitely a big piece of that. Uh, we did not miss Mass on Sunday. And actually for an extended period of my life, we were going daily to Mass. That, that was like how we started our school day before we'd go back home and um, start our school work for the day. And so that is a big blessing in a lot of ways as I look back on that. But also in the midst of all that, I found myself because I was grown up with it um, to kind of just getting desensitized to particularly the mass. Because, you know, even as we have this beautiful ritual and beautiful tradition as Catholics, um, it's, you know, there's a lot of the sameness that happens every single Sunday, every single day if you go to daily mass too. And so um, I started just finding myself going through the motions and kind of lived my life that way for many, many years. Um, and I was going through a lot, especially um, in college, uh, going through a lot of waves of just feeling kind of callous towards um, mass and towards the Eucharist. Um, and just kind of, yeah, just desensitized, just going through the motions so that I could check off a box. Um, I never missed mass for sure, but it didn't always feel, I didn't always want to go and it not, not, wasn't necessarily always a priority to me um, in the same way that it is now. And I think that there are, are um, a couple of uh, stories that really inspired me to look beyond um, what my current reality was. Um, and one of them, it was actually a Eucharistic miracle that um, actually happened, and it happened in our lifetime. Um, this was uh, back in 1996 that a, a Eucharistic miracle happened. Um, and it was in Buenos Aires. And uh, this miracle, essentially how, how it came to be was um, during a mass, uh, a priest found a, a host that was on the floor and had been dropped. And it was a consecrated host um, and it had been soiled and so wasn't able to be consumed. And so what the priest did to follow protocol was that he put the host in some water and put it in the tabernacle so that the host could dissolve um, and uh, then be, you know, the water being taken out. Um, and so they left the, the host in the water for many days in the tabernacle. And when the priest came back, though, he found that the host actually hadn't been dissolved. It had actually enlarged. And uh, the host not only had it been enlarged, but it also had the appearance of um, flesh and blood. And so that priest, during that time, notified the bishop of Buenos Aires, which we might be familiar with him because that, that is uh, Pope Francis. Um, during this time, Pope Francis was uh, the bishop of Buenos Aires. 
And so he had been notified of this and um, they had pictures taken of um, the consecrated host and then it, it was kind of kept quiet. Um, they had the, the tissue in um, preservation in a, a sacred place, but for almost three years, uh, they didn't really do anything with it. They didn't vocalize it, they didn't make it public and it was a pretty private matter. And after those years, they, you know, looked and re-examined and the, the tissue was the same. Um, and it actually, it seemed to have appeared with um, even more um, blood stains um, to the tissue. And so they ended up inviting doctors and some of the top analysis in the, in the world. I think there was one in, in New York that was called and um, had them examine the tissue. And they didn't tell them for bias reasons. They didn't want any any sort of bias to come into play here. And so they didn't tell them where this um, tissue sample had come from, but they just asked it for an honest analysis of the sample they were giving them. And what the, the doctors and the researchers found is actually amazing. Um, one the thing that they found was that the tissue was uh, from the heart muscle and from a specific part of the heart in the left ventricle. And uh, this part of the, the heart was um, particularly uh, crucial in involving keeping the blood flowing through the body and keeping the heart beating. So that was one of the things that they found. Um, another thing that they found was the um, presence of white blood cells, which is kind of a miraculous thing in its own because oftentimes uh, white blood cells die within you know a couple minutes of the tissue being removed and so the fact that there was white blood cells there at all was remarkable and uh, showed that the tissue had been alive when it had been taken and then two with the white blood cells is that uh, the their appearance also showed that there had been significant trauma that had happened particularly to the chest area and the doctors and the researchers supposed that this person um, that the tissue had belonged to had been beaten very severely, especially to the chest, and that had been made it very difficult for this person to breathe. It had been very painful. Um, and when all of this kind of was found, um, they revealed to the doctors in the analysis where this tissue had come from that had been a consecrated host, and uh, they were shocked and said, you know, no science can explain this. This is truly a miracle. And uh, they actually examined the tissue um, and matched the DNA of that tissue to the DNA that was found um, in a previous Eucharistic miracle that had happened hundreds of years ago in Italy. And uh, they found that the DNA, in fact, matched and the blood type, in fact, matched. And that um, the both of them revealed that it was uh, from a middle-aged, Middle Eastern man um, who had undergone some great trauma and physical um, torture. I think about that story. I think about um, what's revealed in that. And the first time that I heard that, I mean, those stories always inspire me and amaze me, but it really forced me to think about, you know, what we profess that we believe that this is really the presence of Jesus in the Eucharist and that he's made, you know, present there right in the middle of mass. And am I looking for him? It reminds me of a, a story that also really deeply impacted me in my walk with Jesus, which is, um, comes from the Gospel of John in chapter 20. And uh, this uh, story involves Mary Magdalene, and she is going to the tomb, to Jesus's tomb after he had died. Um, and she goes there to perform the proper Jewish burial um, custom. And she goes and she finds the tomb empty. And in the midst of her grief and feeling overwhelmed, and I mean, I can't imagine that moment because this is probably the, the time that she felt like she was gonna get closure with Jesus's passing and then he's gone. And she's so caught up in all that emotion that she actually doesn't realize that Jesus is right next to her. She thinks that he's a gardener. And so she looks over at him and she says, Sir, like, if you've taken him, please show me where he is. And Jesus doesn't really say much. He only has to say one word. He says her name. He says Mary. And right in that moment, her eyes are opened and she realizes that it's Jesus, her Lord and her love and her Savior. I hear some of those stories and it actually had a great impact on me because I realized that the mass is personal. And then when I started going to mass with that kind of mindset, I started to discover Jesus in everything. I started to discover him in the songs that we were singing. I started to discover him in the, the readings that we would hear every Sunday. I discovered him in the ancient prayers that we prayed every Sunday that I had been praying since I was a little girl before I could even, you know, read. I was saying some of these prayers. 
And I started to encounter Jesus because in those moments, I actually was hearing him speak to me. I heard him say my name. And in that moment, my, my whole heart was transformed because I realized just how personal Jesus really does make the mass for us. If we're looking, if we have the eyes to see it. And while obviously not every mass are we witnessing, you know, the, the consecrated host change and be fully physical in, in flesh and blood, we're not necessarily hearing Jesus' audible voice say just our name. But I think that both of those things are happening. They're just, they're in a realm that we can't fully see. But that God does want to give us eyes to be able to see those things spiritually. And so as I um, continue on in, in my journey with the Mass, that's something that I, I hold on to and I seek out during the Mass. Because I believe that it's personal and I believe that Jesus did this for me. Um and so that's my prayer for, for all of us, especially once we're able to gather again together at Mass, that we may not take it for granted, but see it as a, a personal declaration of love to each one of us and encounter Jesus and have the eyes to be able to, to see that um, for ourselves and for our families and for our lives. Because the Mass is so personal for Jesus. He's literally giving him or giving himself to us. And so might we be able to return that um, that in the same way and being able to give our, our whole selves, our, our all to Jesus, especially within the context of the mass. So um, that is my, my prayer for us as a parish family. Um, please be assured that uh, you are in my prayers and in my thoughts during this time and uh, God bless. Gospel of the Lord. So with the angels and all the saints, we declare your glory. As with one voice we claim. Body and blood of our Lord. 
Lord Jesus Christ. took bread, and giving thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it. For this is my body, which will be given up for you. Isn't that just awesome sauce? I just think that's amazing. Angel Kirkle would like to tie up this little stay-at-home retreat with some words about her very favorite topic, marriage to Jesus, theology of the body styles. Remember, keep on retreating, be slow, let this soak in, let this ferment, and hear the words of our friend, Angel. So, God wants to marry us, right? Um... So first we want to talk about what is marriage in human terms for just a second, right? Marriage is a permanent union between two people. Check out Matthew chapter 19 where Jesus tells us what marriage is, right? Uh, each person there desires to make a gift of him or herself to the other, right? Without reservation, without condition, the bride totally gives her, desires to give herself to her bridegroom, fully, completely holding nothing back. And the groom, the bridegroom, totally and completely gives himself over to his bride, fully holding nothing back, right? That's their desire to give themselves as a gift to each other. That's marriage, right? And God wants to marry us. How do we know that? Well, because this is the story that is told in the Bible over and over again, right? God, as the perfect bridegroom, wants to pour himself out into us, his bride, totally. And he desires that we would desire to pour ourselves back into him totally. Makes sense, right? So from beginning to end of the Bible, the whole story of God's love is revealed to us um, in that. And, and just so we don't miss it, just so there's no misunderstanding, the whole Bible is bookended in marriages, right? In the beginning, in Genesis, we have the, the marriage of Adam and Eve. And in Revelation, we have the marriage supper of the Lamb. Okay, Now, smack in the middle of the Bible is a little book called The Song of Songs. And this is a really unique book for several reasons um, that we're not going to go into today because it's not a full Bible study. But this Old Testament book, Song of Songs, is just this beautiful love poetry. It's, it's almost erotic, so careful when you're reading it. Um, but despite that, despite being this graphically intense love poetry, it's right here in the heart of scripture, smack in the middle. And it's there for a reason. So there's a cast of characters in the Song of Songs. Um, these include the bridegroom, 
And the bridegroom can be seen as a human bridegroom, right? Or he can be seen as God or Jesus. And the bride can be a human bride. She can be Israel, the church, or the individual Christian, right? So when you're reading Song of Songs, you've got these different characters playing out these roles. Um, and any of those interpretations are valid and beautiful and really applicable to what we're going to talk about today. Now, if you haven't read the Song of Songs before, I highly recommend it, especially right now, especially at this time when we are separated from receiving the Eucharist. Why? Because while it's this beautiful love poem about a bride and bridegroom longing for each other, they never actually get to the wedding day. The whole thing, the whole poem is about anticipation. It's about their desire to be together, but they don't quite make it there by the end of the story, right? Um, and there's a little fantasizing about what that's gonna look like when they're together. There's some fantasizing about what that's gonna look like when it finally happens. So just, just listen to these um, verses. There's not a lot, but just a few. Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, for your love is better than wine, better than the fragrance of your perfumes. Your name is a flowing perfume. The king has brought me to his bedchambers. On my bed at night, I sought him, whom my soul loves. I sought him, but I did not find him. Let me rise then and go about the city, through the streets and the squares, let me seek him whom my soul loves. I sought him, but I did not find him. You have ravished my heart, my sister, my bride. You have ravished my heart with one glance of your eyes, with one bead of your necklace. How beautiful is your love, my sister, my bride. Now that's just a few verses, right? But do you hear the longing they have for each other, this intense love that they, they just can't wait to be together, right? So why don't the bride and the bridegroom in song ever actually make it to the big day? Well, um, I think it's because this book is written before Christ becomes man, right? It's Old Testament. It's before Jesus is born. And the author who is traditionally seen as King Solomon, he knows that the bride is still waiting for the arrival of the bridegroom. And in this poem, he's, he's giving this anticipation, right? He's revealing the anticipation of the bride waiting for her bridegroom. So God wants to marry us. And in the Eucharist, he does. Um, that's why I think it's so important to spend some time during these weeks right now when we can't receive. Spend some time in this book because we are the bride always, right? The, the church is the bride of Christ. We are always the bride. But right now in a particular way, we are the bride in the Song of Songs. I don't know about you, but I miss the Eucharist. A lot. Um, I miss being able to receive my bridegroom in a tangible physical way. I'm a very physical person and so while the introvert in me kind of secretly likes quarantine, don't tell anybody, right? Um, the fact is that I'm feeling very separated from God right now because I can't receive him. So the funny thing is, uh, I kind of think God feels the same way, right? I think that he misses being able to be received by us right now. Not for the same reasons I do, right? He, he doesn't miss me receiving Eucharist for the same reasons I miss receiving Eucharist. He is not so shallow as to let the lack of physical contact be an obstacle to his love for me, right? But, and this is just my thought, but I think that he misses it just simply because he loves me, right? 
he wants to be united with me through the Eucharist because he desires to give himself to me in every way. And right now, I can't receive him. So he misses that. So what's the point in all of this? If you're missing the Eucharist right now, you're not alone. And if you're in our CIA and you were anxiously anticipating receiving the Eucharist at the Easter Vigil, you're not alone. If you've been away from the Eucharist for any reason, and you want to come back, and right now you can't, you're not alone. St. Augustine said that our hearts are restless until they rest in God. Read Song of Songs and you will see a picture of a bride and a bridegroom that are each restless, anxiously waiting to rest in each other. And this is where we are restlessly waiting to join, whether that means for the first time or again with our bridegroom in the Eucharist and being able to rest in each other. God wants to marry us. We just have to say yes. Um, a couple of thoughts for a reflection at this time. If you, if you do decide to read Song of Songs, that's awesome. But whether you do or not, uh, here's some things that you can think about, maybe pray about and, and journal if you're into journaling. Have you ever experienced a feeling of intimate union with God when receiving Him in the Eucharist? What was it like? Can you describe it? Do you seek God when He feels far away? Or you feel alone? What do you do to find him? What are you willing to risk searching for him? The purpose of the Christian life is to make us one with God, to be joined so totally and completely with him that we share his divine nature. How does Song of Songs draw you closer to him? and unite you with him. And do you desire to be united with God as much as he desires to be united with you? I hope to see you all soon in the Eucharist. Thank you so much for joining us on this amazing retreat day. We really wish we could be with you live and, and do some more interactive kinds of things. Um, but for this stay at home retreat, Watch this video, turn it off, spend some time in prayer, open your scriptures, see where Jesus is leading you, right? And um, I would just like to end with, with something I've always wanted to do. Romper, stomper, bumper, boo, tell me, tell me, tell me do. Magic mirror, tell me today. Did all my friends have fun and pray? I see Cadence and Kay and Claire, Ladina, Jacob, Easton and RJ, Melissa and John and John and John. Oh, and I see John and John and John and Kristen and Christopher, Kristen, Kristin and Chris and Tiffany and Amanda, Callahan, Bill, Rick, Rich, Richard, Dick, Ricky, John and John and of course John. I see Leandra and Sean and Casey and John and Chris and Christopher and Amanda, Jan and John and Jane and Nick and Patty and Susie. I see Tim and Cindy and Dave and David and Diane.